know, if there's this particular place that you think, you know, you'll get some good training from, or there's some good mentors there, or um, you think there's a style that, that, that um, uh, is, is being used within that practice or organization, go to where, you know, it resonates for you. Uh, I, th- I think it's important to, to try and have a really good team around you as an early uh, career psychologist. So, you know, at least in my eyes, I, I, I made a mistake. Um, and I think I can comfortably say it was a mistake um, where I went straight out of uni and, and, and started, um, you know, private practice. And when I say started private practice as in um, worked alone, Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. Today's episode is focused on really advice for early career psychologists. And I have Mary Andretis to help me out with this. She's coming up to doing so herself in terms of starting her career. And so she gets to ask lots of questions around career paths, selecting an organization to work for, being an employee versus contractor, finding a supervisor, what to look for, and what to be prepared for if you want to start your own business. Hope there's some advice in it for you, uh, but it is specific for early career psychologists. Mary, great to have you back on the podcast. Hi, Nesh. It's really great to be back on the podcast. And um, today's topic is one that I think will be quite valuable for a lot of people, myself included. And so today I'm hoping to pick your brain a bit for some advice on early career psychologists and um, hopefully we can get into some of the the real details and specifics a bit later on but um, I thought maybe to frame the conversation we could talk really generally about what a psychologist is what they do and maybe what setting you might find them in. Probably the best way to approach that one is is where I'm most familiar. Um, I mean, I, th- I think there are psychologists that can do you know a, a lot of different roles, whether it's you know neuropsych, whether it's educational psych, you know psych that does assessments predominantly, um, uh, organisational psychs. It, it, there's lots of different branches of, of of psychology. Probably the most commonly known is what I might sort of uh, dub as a, you know, a counseling psychologist, you know, someone who clinically likes to work in a counseling therapy type role, um, you know, with clients around the difficulties that they're facing. So I'll speak predominantly about that um, just because I don't know enough about the other areas. Um, I could speak broadly, but, um, you know, it'll probably be burning ears, listening, going, that's not what we do. Um, you know, speaking, you know, about forensic psychology, it's not my, my, um, you know, my, my cup of tea. So it's best I stick to what I know. Fantastic. Um, so I guess in the context of that sort of um, counselling type of psychologist, um, maybe we could talk briefly about um, the pathways to gaining your registration in that field of psychology. Sure, sure. Look, they are changing. There's all, they, they, there's been lots of movement over the last, you know, uh, well, in actual fact, probably over the last uh, uh, maybe even 10 years um there, there's there's lots of different different ways to go through whether it be a six-year degree um going uh, you know um a bachelor's then a postgraduate or an honors degree uh, honors um year and then like two years for masters or it might be like a four plus two which is kind of like an internship type um style there's also a, a five plus one there's you know clinical doctorate there's Lots of different ways to, to, to become a psychologist, but effectively, um, whatever path that, that works for each individual um, you know, has to be you know, appreciated and honoured and, and, and we're all different shapes and sizes. So I think it's great that we've got flexibility in, in um, you know, the Australian system at least to, to be able to offer different, different ways. Um, but predominantly it's going to be attending uni for a while um, and then whether there's some, some, some more, uh, you know, another component to that, like, you know, the four plus two or five plus one, where you do like an internship, you know, uh, work um, as a placement, so to speak, um, kind of, you know, an intern learning on the job, so to speak. Yeah, great. And um, 
Do you think there are any, I guess, benefits um, or disadvantages to choosing one path over the other? Or is it just purely around kind of what fits best for you and what your goals are? Yeah, Ouch, it's a hard question. This is where all the controversy comes in, particularly in, in at least in Australia in terms of going, you know, six years at university or whether it's four years at university plus a two-year internship or, a, you know, five plus one. Look, I, I actually think it's it's really about going out and um, picking what works for each person. You know, it's very, very difficult to go out and say this is what's right. Um, you know, we know that there is uh, a, 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 you know, pros and cons in, in, in both directions, but each person that you ask is going to be biased, right? So rather than going out and putting biases out there, um, you know, they're a great, great, um, you know, enthusiastic human beings who, who love working in psychology. To me, so long as we get get lots of them in our industry who can go out and demonstrate, you know, that passion and and and, and you know, real real ethic around, um, you know, what what our core beliefs are in terms of helping people, being evidence based, you know, in our practice, um, you know, nurturing, caring, um, you know, non judgmental and the like. I really don't care how someone you know, get, get, gets through and, and what's the right way. The truth is we all continue to do professional development. Um, like in anything, there's going to be, um, you know, uh, differences in skill levels and, and competencies across the board. Um, you know, di- different personalities that will meet different client needs and the like. So, um, you know, is, is, is one superior to another? Um, yeah, many could argue. Um, maybe I prefer to, 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 to stay out of the argument and, and um, you know, try, try and be less political. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think it's fantastic that there are so many pathways to attaining a registration as a psychologist. And like you said, although there might be pros and cons to picking one pathway over the other, um, in the end, we're all in it for that valuable client related work and wanting positive outcomes for in the mental health of the clients we work with. And I think that's at the core of everyone who's a psychologist, really. Um, and okay. truth be told, I, for, for me, so long as I'm a practicing psychologist, right? I really don't care what you call me. Um, you know, I, I happen to be, um, you know, uh, uh, endorsed as a clinical psych. Truth be told, when I, when I started, you know, when I was in my first year and someone said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a psychologist. Mm. Not registered, not, not, you know, clinical, not, you know, other endorsements. I was just like, I just want to work with people. And, and you know, I've, I've kind of um, reached my dream. So, you know, I imagine everyone else is in, in, in the same sort of boat. They want to work with human beings and, 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 you know, there are other considerations and there are monetary um, considerations as, as well. Um, but, you know, pe- people who are, who are um, uh, driven and, you know, want to work hard uh, and, um, uh, you know, enthusiastic about their work, they, 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 can, they can build their skill level faster by, by doing more hours and the like. So it's neither here nor there in my eyes. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of people who do enter this field tend to have that mentality upon entering of just wanting to be a psychologist and wanting to help people and wanting to work in the mental health space. And um, a lot of the specifics kind of come later down the track and maybe it gets a little bit convoluted or whatever. But I think at the core of it is just that that desire to help people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So... Um, you've done your six years at uni or your four plus two or your five plus one or your doctorate or whatever pathway you've chosen. And we're now out here starting our careers as psychologists. Um, and I think I can speak for a few people and definitely for myself when I say it can be a little bit overwhelming trying to figure out where do we go for jobs? Who's going to want to hire me? I'm only my first year out. Um, so I guess I'm kind of wondering if you have any any ideas about where early career psychologists can or should be looking for work in that, that initial stages of the, their career. Sure, sure. Can I uh, throw the, the question back back to you and say, where, you know, where would you like to be working? What, what's the, the group, you know, the population? What, what, what excites you? What are you trying? What, what's the intent? 
Yeah. And I guess that's where it might get, it might be really easy for some people in that they have this really clear idea that they want to work with adults or they want to work with adolescents or the elderly. Um, I think for some people, they don't really know. And maybe some people haven't really had experience working with one particular group or um, age group or whatever. So um, they're sort of feeling a little bit lost and and not sure. So um, perhaps thinking of, you know, do I pick something and, you know, pick working with adolescents and just trial that out and see if I like that? Or do I go into something where I'm going to get exposed to lots of different age groups or um, which path do I pick? And am I going to pigeonhole myself if I pick one path and stick with that? So I think it can get really um, overwhelming sometimes. Absolutely. And, and, and I, would, I would really always answer that question from a very much an ACT perspective, which kind of says, you know, what are your values? Mm. Who and what's important? Um, and who and what's important is, 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 I think vital to ask our, our, ourselves because you know the type of work that we are looking to do as well might might be framed by you know who and what's important. So it could be even just personal circumstances uh, changes what sort of work we're looking for, whether it's part time, whether it's full time. Um, you know whether we do want to maybe pigeonhole ourselves uh, if if we call it that. I actually don't think that anyone ever pigeonholes themselves. It's really about whether you're willing to be versatile, whether you're willing to learn a new skill set. Um, you know, if I kind of look at myself, I've, I've pigeonholed myself to seeing adults. Um, well, that's kind of reasonable because I like working with adults and um, I'm happy to be in that. But if I really wanted to kind of shift and pivot and start working with kids, I'm going to go out and, and uh, you know, find a great supervisor, you know, who, who works with kids, got lots of, has lots of experience probably go to a practice that works with lots of kids so I could you know, speak with other colleagues in that space um, or to an organization that does that does that as well uh, I'd definitely be doing a whole lot of professional development and all of a sudden I'm, I'm starting to pigeon my pigeonhole myself in another in another space you know I think the great thing about psychology is is um, it's really useful to, uh, uh, to to pigeonhole and become a specialist and I know we're not allowed to use that word when, when it comes to marketing and the like. Um, you know, can't say I'm an expert in or I'm a specialist in. You know, we've got to be a bit more vague um, uh, for very good reason. <clears throat> but uh, it's important to specialise uh, and, and, and have great experience in, in, in an area of interest. So I'm a big believer of, of following your interest. Uh, why? Because that's where you're going to be most you know, passionate um, you know, I think there, there is a bit of a challenge for um, new graduates of kind of either saying I'm not really sure um, and so I'll kind of say yes to everything. Um, but I think most people know what they don't like at least. They might not know what they do like, um, but they certainly more often than not know what they don't like. So that could be a, a potential first clue as to – you know where and, and, and you know, where I might want to go out and work, or the population group, or the presenting type of problems, um, as a starting base. I'd like to encourage everyone to to really kind of get outside their comfort zone because you just never know. I mean, I now work with couples, which initially I didn't have an interest in. I thought it would you know, it would be too too painful and difficult, um, and. Now that's something that I, I um, you know, enjoy working with as well. So I think it's important to go out and, and explore. But as a new graduate, early early career, I, th- I think it's wise to go towards the things that you might be interested in or you think you're interested in uh, because we don't want to feel completely out of our depth when we start. You know, we're going to have our natural kind of concerns when we're starting. You know, all of our doubts, I don't know anything, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the imposter syndrome. Uh, truth is, you know, this is why we, we, we require everyone to go out and, you know, put six years of training as a bare minimum. So there's a huge volume of exposure, training, you know, supervision, guidance along the way, you know, before uh, uh, we kind of uh, become a little bit more independent. But, uh, you know, it's important to pick the space that, that resonates for you. You know, why, why, why should we... Do things that um, 
we're not particularly interested in because I, I think psychologists do their best work wherever they're passionate. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a really good point that you raised about um, following what you're passionate about, but also keeping an open mind and being aware that things might change over time. And just because you've chosen a particular um, age group or demographic to work with at one point, it doesn't mean you're locked into that forever um, and things might change. And like you said, you didn't think you'd be working with, with couples and now you really enjoy working with couples. Um, in my current role, I work with adolescents and I thought that I would purely want to work with adults um, throughout my entire career, but I found that I really enjoyed working with adolescents. So um, that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, so I guess I'm kind of wondering um, in terms of getting that first first job or that, you know, first or second job early on in your career. Um, I guess I'm thinking, do you think it's, it's best to kind of look on like seek and, you know, websites like that or approach companies directly, or is it kind of just really dependent on what you want and who you want to work for? Look, if I was speaking with a client, I would be saying, uh, leave no stone unturned. So if there's a practice you want to work for, phone them direct, email them direct, contact them direct. Um, wh why wait until they have a, uh, a, a position available? You just go out and ask, right? If there's this particular place that you think, you know, you'll get some good training from or there's some good mentors there or um, you think there's a style that, that, that um, uh, is, is being used within that practice or organisation, Go to where, you know, it resonates for you. Uh, I, th I think it's important to, to try and have a really good team around you as an early uh, career psychologist. So, you know, at least in my eyes, I, I, I made a mistake. Um, and I think I can comfortably say it was a mistake um, where I went straight out of uni and, and, and started, um, you know, private practice. And when I say started private practice as in um, worked alone, so uh, didn't have a team, didn't have a, uh, you know, a supervisor on site. Um, uh, and, you know, clearly, you know, I was fairly ambitious, you know, uh, but there are some huge pains and difficulties that comes along with that. And I think it's really important to try and focus on our career development, you know, skill acquisition, being part of a team, getting exposure to lots of different um, styles and you know languages that our uh, colleagues might use um, to get a good array of of clients that are you know where I feel most competent and before I start jumping into the deep end you know I was uh, probably well I was naive um, and I tell you what it, it's a sink or swim type of scenario um, I, I think there's great great value in that but it takes a p particular personality but I, if I had my time again, I wouldn't have done that by any means. I would have gone out and worked within a, a team with a really good supervisor. Um, you know, I think there were some clumsy things that uh, uh, I could have avoided um, uh, with a team around. Uh, and, um, you know, that's where I think psychologists can get into trouble, where they don't feel like they either have the support um, all the experience around them to, to be able to lean on and they start making quick decisions. Um, and so we can, you know, uh, you know, a, classic, a classic version might be people seeing um, uh, in cities at least having a conflict of interest in that they're seeing members of the same family or something like that, uh, where it's such a simple uh, uh, such a simple issue to address that comes up very commonly when you're in a team um, and it's a lot harder to go out and self-regulate when you're by yourself and so we need you know good supervision um, strong mentors people who've seen you know, ethical dilemmas um, because even though we talk about it when it comes to real life we become humans uh, and we might find it difficult to say no to people for example or um, you know we're conflict avoidance so we don't want to disappoint someone so on and so forth and so you know, we've got to understand that we're 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 um, you know, humans first, psychologists second, uh, and humans are, are best when we have a good team, good supervisor, 
um, you know, great mentors, experienced clinicians around us. So I would strongly recommend, you know, being a part of a team and, and, and the bigger the team, the, the, the better in my eyes. Yeah, definitely. And um, even from a personal experience, I've found that being a part of a team has been really valuable, just um, purely in just gaining that insight from other people who have had different experiences, um, different knowledge, come from different um, fields or areas. Um, And I guess even from a personal perspective of that informal debriefing with people, um, you know, after a challenging client, if you're in a team, you can spend a couple of minutes, you know, debriefing or talking about what happened um, and just having that opportunity can really just help you get through the day um, and give you some insights and um, just get a bit, take, take a bit of that, that load off your shoulders um, as well from a personal perspective. So um, yeah. I, and um, I think during this time, um, you know, in the middle of, of COVID and um, I personally have transitioned to um, talking to clients over the phone um, and being working from home and not having that team around me and not having my manager, you know, a few uh, offices a few desks away from me and um, I'm finding that really challenging and I'm finding that um, I'm really missing that that informal conversation and those debriefing chats and you know having the opportunity to just go up to my manager and say hey you know this and this happened and just want to make sure that you know that's all good or you know do you have any advice and um, it's it's really difficult now so um, yeah I'm getting a yeah. psychology can be lonely Right, you know, yeah. we, we, we we spend so much of our time, you know, in our in our, in our consulting rooms, and so it can be extremely lonely. And you know, one of the great challenges with going into private practice, um, and there's two different, uh, I, uh, I suppose, models. One is as an employer um, or, or employee, sorry, arrangement, and one is as a contract arrangement. And I think they are two different um, experiences. The employee arrangement means that you're part of a team and so you know you'll have lunch together with everybody you know that you'll you'll have supervision that that that, that's provided you're going to have you know hopefully if it's a good good um you know organization some social gatherings you know that that it's really a team vibrant sort of environment you know i mean here we've spent a huge volume of time and energy in, in in creating a space where we've got a large breakout area called the marshmallow room uh, where every day, you know, without fail, everyone from 12 to one, um, you know, has lunch. Now, whether you want to come in or not is, is completely up to you. Might be running errands through, through the city, but it's important that we have that open and available every day so that we're not isolated. Um, you know, it, it, it's such an important space of, you know, our self care um, also about, uh, getting out of our, our our monotony, our you know, out of our head. You know, sometimes we can even feel um, uh, a sense of stagnation when we don't speak with our colleagues because we haven't been challenged or we haven't heard another perspective or we just need to be you know picked up by somebody. You know, if we've had a couple of you know tough tough, tough consults. So that that family feel is is you know, really important. I think the contractor model is a little bit difficulty because uh, difficult because we are likely to see you know individual ABN holders who they might go out and choose to see a client over having lunch, or they might choose to have lunch at you know eleven till twelve, um, so they can get away earlier or you know, a little bit later. You know, you won't tend to have as, as many social gatherings because there's that drive of trying to, um, uh, you know, balance your billable hours and, and, and all the other challenges that comes with that. So I think that it's less family friendly. There's greater autonomy. People are coming in and out um, based on their own schedules. And so um, it loses some of that. You know, there's competitiveness in, in that space. That's, that, that's the environment. So I think... Uh, you know, if I was to, to, to suggest, you know, or make a recommendation, I think an in employee arrangement is definitely, um, and look, that, that tends to, to work for a lot of people even later on in, in, in career, but certainly uh, in an early career, 
going out and having stability where you're not competing for, for, for clients and having to worry about all of that and everything else goes along. Um, you want strong administrative support and you know, supervisors, colleagues, you know, time to also um, not only go out and seek advice when you are challenged, but also to celebrate your wins. And there's something really important about, you know, uh, a really nice dinner uh, is a bit boring by yourself. Um, so, you know, whenever, whenever any of us get a nice voucher to go to dinner or whatever it might be, or we, we're thinking about going somewhere nice and fancy, we don't say, oh, you know, a table for one, please. Um, let's make it at 8, 8 p.m. You know, I'm going to have a cracker of a night. Um, we, we try and, and, and do it with somebody. And whether it's a partner, whether it's a friend, a colleague, um, we like to share it and, and I think that, that that space is really important and, and you know, private practice as an employee uh, has, you know, in my eyes, huge advantages. Um, but then you've got a whole lot of other, you know, whether it's government health, whether it's um, schools and the like. But once again, we've got to think about where is there going to be a team. You know, schools can be a lonely place. Um, uh, I mean, school psychologists do incredible, incredible work, but it's, it's it's lonely because, you know, you might see lots of other teachers or be part of the, the student welfare um, area, but they're not psychologists. Um, so it's kind of important to have, you know, some of your own around, so to speak. Um, not putting down anyone else, they do good work as well. Uh, but we, we need some of our own because, you know, we think in a particular way. We, we've gone through all of our training. There's an evidence base. We, we understand where we're coming from and, and uh, to be excluded um, or to be away from our peers, uh, uh, that wouldn't be my first preference anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. And I think that's particularly important um, in the context of early career psychologists who are kind of just getting off on their feet and um, finding their place in the industry to be surrounded by a really supportive um, team of other psychologists and a manager on site and someone you can, you know, turn to, I think is so important. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, on that topic of, of finding that first job, um, whether there are any particular um, things you should look for in a good employer and then on the flip side, whether there are any red flags that early career psychologists should be aware of um, when they're entering a new job. Yeah, I think it's really important that when, when you are impro- approaching you know, employers, you are able to have a good conversation about what you're looking for, um, what the client group that you're looking to, to um, uh, work with, whether this capacity to have breadth in that client group. So someone might go out and say, look, I'm, I am interested in working with, with adults, but I would like to, you know, as I develop you know, in a year or two time, start potentially working with you know, younger adults or even adolescents. And to be able to go out and have that breadth, breadth um, so that you can kind of, you know, skill yourself up further. Because as I said, you kind of know what you don't like to start with. But similarly, you need to go out and taste it to actually find out. And, and you know, like yourself, you know, there, there was experiences that I had, particularly in my training, where, where I said, I don't know if I really like this. But having gone into some of my placements, I went, look, it's still not my, my great preference, but I... You know, I didn't mind it. I mean, there, were, there were lots of aspects that were enjoyable and fun. And, um, and so, you know, the adolescent space opened up for me. So it's only really of, of, of recent that I've stopped seeing adolescents. Uh, so, you know, when I look at how my journey has, has moved, you know, I started with uh, kids um, on, 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 on the spectrum, so, so, so to speak, uh, at least during my, 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 my training through to, you know, when, when I started out seeing adolescents and, and, and adults of late, I've, I've moved away from, from adolescents. I still see one here or there if a GP sort of calls up and says, you know, there's a specific um, a, a client and we want them to specifically see you for, you know, whatever the reasons might be. Um, uh, but other than that, there's, there's someone better down the corridor to, to send them to. Um, but I'm obviously so a couples as well. So you want to have that breadth and, and grow into a position rather than having to shift around and move and, 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 and so on. So I think you know, a good employer will go out and understand that and, 
be able to provide uh, opportunities for that. Uh, I think also having a, a team is really important. So an, em, an employer that is very strong on the importance of supervision, the importance of professional development, um, that supervision is beyond just formal supervision. So, for example, you know, we do uh, here a, a strategic um, supervision twice a month, you know, once individual, once as a group, and then there's you know, a bunch of, of really informal supervision. So, you know, a day doesn't go by where a psychologist doesn't come into my room and we have a chat about something that's an ethical dilemma, about how to respond to you know, competing demands or, you know, a report request has come in and how should we approach it, you, know, you name it, or, you know, a client that, 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 that that's particularly, you know, um, difficult at the moment, all sorts of uh, things. It's important that we have, you know, strong access to um, not only a, a supervisor, but also our more experienced colleagues. So I think a team is, is, is you know, incredibly essential um you know to get the most out of out of you know what we do plus early career i, I think it's all about exposure so you know to, to hear someone in the office who's you know incredibly passionate about you know you know cbt or schema or you know act or interpersonal therapy you name it whatever it is it's just amazing to, to, to hear other people's perspectives, opinions, experiences, to pick someone's brain and say, oh, I'm working with someone who's, you know, disclosed some traumas occurred. How would you go out and, and you know, approach this? It feels a bit intimidating, a bit kind of scared. You know, the mantra of do no harm is, is, is showing up for me. You know, I'm, I'm starting to feel a bit anxious. You know, there's maybe some, some um, uh, 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 Freudian sort of, Transference going going on. Was it Freud that talked about transference or? No, it wasn't. I think so. Was it? Was it Freud? I have to look it up. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, we're talking about it just the other day, but it's important to to explore all these all these spaces. You know, in in terms of picking people's brains. So big team. Um, strongly strongly agree with that. Also, I think it's important to choose a an employer that represents also who you are. You know, whether it's an employer that's innovative, whether they are, you know, uh, leading a a um, you know industry. I mean, I I start off with with an organisation called Catholic Care. They used to be called Centre Care. Um, you know, their ethics, what they stood for. Uh, was 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 incredible and and uh, not from a, a religious perspective. Uh, I mean, I don't hold a particular type of um, leaning, uh, but Catholic Care stood up for you know looking after people, caring for people, and 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 you know most importantly looking after their staff as well. Um, you know, the, the the in actual fact, the my my manager at the time, um, Ann Kerwin, uh, I believe she's now uh, at least the CEO of a, of a region, I, I believe. I, I don't think I got that wrong. She was my manager, amazing human being, you know. Uh, shout out to, to, to Anne if she's uh, um, listening. Uh, you know, what an amazing place to go out and, 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 and you know, cut your teeth, so, so to speak. And that was giving, giving opportunity, encouraging. You know, she, she saw I was very enthusiastic and gave me lots of opportunities. And you know, it was always there available to kind of, you know, steer me down the right, right direction when, you know, I was a bit naive, asked silly questions or made some, some, some funny errors. Um, you know, it, it's just nice to, to, to have people behind you, you know, people that are going to, you know, back you, so, so to speak. It gives you confidence and we need that in early career as, as, as clinicians. Definitely. And I think um, sort of thinking about that, I think I've been very um, fortunate in my team leaders and my managers throughout my um, counselling experience and, and working with first adults and now adolescents. Um, and I think the big thing that, that sticks out to me is that um, both of my team leaders uh, that I've had in this field had an open door policy. Um, and that was just so comforting to me, just getting started in this field, working with people, um, that I knew I could always talk to them, even if it was just to quickly run something by them about something that had happened, um, a procedure, a client. Um, it was so valuable to me to have that experience. Um, so I, I agree. I think those are 
fantastic things to look for in an employer. Um, I guess um, on the flip side, talking about red flags, um, are there any in particular that stand out to you that, that early career psychologists should look for? I guess not only in an employer, but maybe in an organization um, or in terms of getting taken advantage of. Maybe um, I have heard stories where some employers will really push early career psychologists for hours just because they know how passionate and how driven they are and how badly they want to get into the field. And um, yeah, I've heard some stories where they might push them to do, you know, so many clients a day, eight, nine, 10 hour, uh, clients a day. Um, are there any other sort of red flags that come to mind for you? Yeah, look, I think, I think that, 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 that that's a common one that I've certainly heard lots of in terms of, you know, mm-hmm. expected client um, you know, bookings. Uh, I mean, here at, at Strategic Psychology, we have an average of about five, 5.25. Um, the great challenge that we always find in this sort of space is to be able to see five, you know, 5.25 sort of space. Um, let's just call it five. Often there needs to be, you know, more bookings than that. And so some days with, you know, uh, DNAs, uh, uh, you know, um, no arrivals, late cancellations, you might see four, even three in a day. Sometimes you might see six. Um, But there, there has to be a limit. Now, interestingly, I think we're all different beasts. You know, most of us at that at that space of five are, are fairly comfortable. We can go out and achieve that, you know, and a one-off six here or there is, is usually not an issue because, you know, the average is there and, you know, you'll get four the following day. The numbers that you're talking about where someone might see, you know, consistently seven, eight, nine, um, you know, for, for a lot of people, I don't think we're built very well to do that i am personally i i I can see 10 in a day and it doesn't phase me i i'm I'm rejuvenated when i see my clients i i feel best when i'm seeing clients um so i i i I find that you know extremely enjoyable and and you know often when i when i get home my wife goes how was your day it's almost a representation of how many clients i've seen you know as to how i respond Um, it's always a really good day when i've had a really full full day and I've, i've i've enjoyed that but as I said, we're all different beasts, right? And so, so there, 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 there's a lot of people that, you know, doing consistent seven, eight um, would just be, you know, um, you know death for them. Uh, and once again, they'll burn out. They'll start getting resentful. They won't enjoy, enjoy the experience. So I think it's important to go out and uh, uh, find what you think is, is, is reasonable. I think for those out there who don't know what reasonable is, I think the industry is, you know, reasonably kind of sitting at about that five um, sort of level. Uh, I think that's a, that's a reasonable amount when you think about working, you know, seven and a half hours a day. Um, you know, it kind of is, is, is a ratio of roughly around, roughly around uh, 70% um, you know, client time, and about 30% uh, administration time. You know, once we start seeing sort of, you know, 85, 90 um, percent. Um, most people can't sustain that because they're not built. Um, you know, we're not built the same. So, you know, that, that's certainly a red flag. I think a red flag uh, is also about, um, at least for me, I, I think having a you know a team. I keep going back to this sort of space, and I'm biased because I, it for me, it's very very important. You know, in in how we run run our um, uh, uh, practice. You know, if we're not going out and doing uh, social, um, you know, regular social engagements, let me just step back a bit. We spend too much time at work, right? I mean, that that that, that that's clear. And and the truth the truth is, we're we're very privileged to to probably only you know work thirty eight hours and and still be able to make a living because many countries um, that just doesn't occur. So. Um, we're super, super, super fortunate. Um, we've got great privilege. We've got, you know, a lot to be grateful for. Um, at the same time, I think it's important that we go out and balance that as well. And I think because we're spending 38 hours at work, um, it should be enjoyable. It should be fun. It should be social. You should walk in with a smile, um, you know, which kind of says the staff should, you know, want to go out and work there. Um, so if you know any of the staff in an organization, call them up and say, you know, do you enjoy it? Are there social, uh, um, you know, events that you attend? Um, you know, are you guys kind of, does it feel homely? Does it feel, 
like you belong? You know, is it enjoyable? Do you laugh during lunch? Well, what's the whole experience? There is nothing worse than going into a, a job that you don't feel like you belong or it, it's got a culture that's um, uh, um, purely work-related, you know, kind of, you know, go, go, go. That, who wants to work in that? We, 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 we select our partners very, very, very specifically. Um, we should be selecting our employer in the same way, um, which means, you know, if, if there's a particular employer that, that, that you really hope to, to um, you know, work for, just contact them. Right? Um, I mean, another thing I'd very, very much encourage, uh, and you've, you've hit the nail on the head, is be open-minded about, you know, uh, giving back to uh, an, an employer or you know, an organisation. You know, the more you go out and, and work as a team, you work hard, you know, it kind of goes in your direction as well because there's more flexibility, flexibilities and the like. So use that enthusiasm, be passionate. Um, you know, once again, it rubs off on everybody and, and you know, it, it's a much better space as well. So, you know, where you can step in, be, be part of a team. Um, if, if the organisation is already fractured, you know, it's not really a team. Um, this is why I'm, I'm not convinced about that contractor space now it works for lots of people don't get me wrong there's lots of people that that that's the right model for for them they're quite happy to to you know forego lunch or not have as many social engagements and and, and you know, forego some of the team great that's fine um, but for those who want to be part of a team and, and and you know have more opportunity to to develop their skills you know learn more i think having that that, that sort of team family environment is important um simple things you know read read your read your contracts make sure that uh you know you are signing up for you know what you think you're signing up for um you know that's important you need to kind of look at all those things about are you getting paid um you know what, what whatever's sort of reasonable in that industry i know it's very very different for you know whether it's you know private sector whether it's you know public whether it's um, you know, schools, whether it's you know, NGOs, um, you know, we need we need we need to make sure we get all the all those great benefits. And 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 the the employer benefit is obviously not only all the things that I've that I've um, uh, outlined, but paid leave, paid supervision, uh, paid well, uh, four weeks sick leave. Sorry, four weeks annual leave, two weeks sick leave. There's thirteen at least in Canberra. There's thirteen. Um, public holidays uh, each year, um, which is like two and a half weeks worth. Um, uh, so many different, different you know, important um, aspects to, to, to look at. Just understand what you're signing up for. I think that's really great advice. And I think um, it's important for a lot of early career psychologists to be aware of because a lot of the time we're so eager to get into the field and so excited to get a job that um, it can be very easy to overlook um, whether we're being mistreated in the job, whether we're being taken advantage of or being pushed too far um, or not being given that, that um, opportunity to grow in the field. So I think they're all things that are great to keep in mind and to continually be aware of as you progress um, within that job or throughout your career in general. Um, we've spoken a little bit about supervision, um, but I thought maybe we could talk a little bit more in detail about um, supervision as an early career psychologist, because I know that um, having supervision for me in my counselling roles has been so important. And um, I started out in these roles with not much experience at all. So having a really good supervisor on site um, was invaluable to me. Um, what should early career psychologists be looking for in a primary supervisor? I think there's, there's a number of aspects to, to look at when it comes to supervisor. I, I always find the first thing, at least for, for, for me, I like to choose someone that I respect. Um, uh, for whatever reason, the people that we tend to respect, you know, whether it's as people as, or as clinicians, we tend to take on board um, and listen more and kind of contemplate and pull these sort of uh, ideas apart more when we've spent time with someone that we kind of you know, might look up to or, you know, we see as a bit of a mentor. 
So pick someone that you like, pick someone that you respect, um, you know, pick someone that you think has great experience. Um, I, I think that's really important. You know, also, I think it's, it, it, it's useful that you try and, and, and look at someone who you think is going to challenge you. Uh, and and you know, supervision can look look vastly different between supervisors. Everything from um, uh, providing some, you know, providing the clinician with lots of opportunities to look at different perspectives, almost like counselling like, um, uh, when they're kind of doing case formulation, through to someone who might provide their own um, perspective that could be, you know, uh, explored. Um, ultimately, it's really about being able to, to be challenged, to, to look outside, you know, your, your box um, so that you can kind of go, oh, I didn't think of that about that or I wouldn't have actually approached that way or that's a nice way that I could kind of, you know, uh, have a conversation with, with my next um, you know, client or it actually even just philosophically questions what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and, you know, how much of what I'm doing is, 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 you know, intention based on what I initially wanted to do with my clients, you know, a classic example, obviously around co- talking about confidence because often, you know, we, 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 we're lacking a little bit of confidence um, or we want more if we can call it that. Uh, sometimes an early career psych- psychologist might, um, want to or feels out of depth seeing a client who, with, with trauma um it's really important to to be able to get supervision around that but also to appreciate and understand you know, that it's not necessarily uh the, the problem isn't always necessarily your approach it's it's often about our own fear and the transference mm-hmm. counter transference the fear of you know do no harm uh, and what we're actually working with is always going to be the same damn thing. It's called a human being. And, and that human being is coming to us effectively saying, I'm finding it really difficult to live in my skin. And if we boil that further down, they're going to effectively say, I don't like these unwanted thoughts. And I'm not sure how to live in my skin with these unwanted thoughts. I've also got this other thing called unwanted feelings or emotions, sensations. I don't know how to live with them. They're effectively going to also be saying, I'm doing a whole bunch of avoidance patterns. Um, I'm not quite fully aware of what they are. Hopefully you'll be able to tell me. But these are all the things that I do to cope. Then when, when we start sort of just breaking it down and going a bit more macro, for example, um, we might kind of appreciate that it's not so scary to work with this. You know, we're, we're assisting someone to, in actual fact, feel their feelings or to be able to speak about, you know, these unwanted thoughts, how to sit with those unwanted thoughts, how to maybe distance themselves from those un- unwanted thoughts or, you know, how to make more space for those feelings, how to act in accordance with what they value rather than the feelings, you know, and, and thoughts they're having inside their skin. We start breaking that down and, and it gives us a, a potentially a different insight. So we want to be pushed. We want our supervisor to push us, you know, to, to, to get us to see different perspectives. Um, it's also important to have great versatility in, in supervision. So we want, want someone that you feel you can go to not just for clinical um, uh, consideration. I, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, as a clinician going into supervision, I'm actually a human first. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not just about case formulation and treatment planning and talking through through that. It's also about I as a human feel this in session or I as a human have this going on outside of work that follows me, comes in with me, travels with me into work, um, and I'm struggling with being in my own skin, juggling these things. We need to have great trust, you know, um, and, and hence, you know, uh, great uh, confidentiality and, and, and trust around privacy and like in our supervision as well to someone that we feel is not going to be judgmental. Um, they're going to be objective. They're going to be compassionate, you know, kind, um, certainly have the experience of uh, 
uh, within um, uh, within their own practice because they've more than likely already gone through your own struggles um, and they can speak from um, not necessarily authority but they can speak from a position of having been through something similar once um, and there's many different versions of going through it but we need to be able to talk about our personal lives our personal experience along with our clinical um, person you know and, and this is why supervision is is not you know, this linear case um, you know focused uh, work it, it it's about you know i want to talk about me as the human being what's going on for me um you know what i'm struggling with uh, along with you know I'm, it could be i'm struggling with assisting my client um but even that could be you know more about what's going on inside you uh, where often we feel like we're not doing something um, and we might be mm. I think those are all fantastic points and I, I like that you really touched on that human element of supervision and the supervisor needing to be receptive to not only what's going on for you in the context of, you know, your clients, but what's going on for you in the context of how is this actually impacting you personally. I guess um, as you were talking about that, what came to mind for me was um, perhaps sometimes supervision, if you do have a good supervisor, if you're fortunate enough to have someone that you truly connect with and that you're able to have those human to human personal conversations with, um, could it sort of be bordering almost on the line of like a therapy session sometimes and could that be dangerous at times? Potentially it could be, um, you know, there's, there's, there, there's always lines. Um, I think, uh, psychologists are in many ways being invited by their clients to be friends. Um, you know, there might be, you know, something that's said that we would in a social setting um, uh, reciprocate laughter on, but a, a psychologist might not necessarily reciprocate laughter because it might send a message. Um, similarly, a supervisor uh, understands that it's not a uh, counselling session, it's a supervision session. And so they have to be able to work with, you know, um, the psychologist, the human, the, the, um, uh, the internal governor on the inside you know the, the the conversation with the inside the skin all at the same time and be focused on you know, what the task at hand is which is supervision not counseling so supervision should never be counseling but it often has you know close edges that come to, together because supervision will talk about emotions and where someone's feeling and how the outside world might be affecting their work for example, uh, that's not necessarily um, exclusive to therapy. Um, it's also inside supervision. Um, it's also probably inside a conversation with a uh, with a friend. You know, saying, "Ah, oh, you know, I'm struggling with work because this is what's going on outside." So, you know, a good supervisor uh, can appreciate that, and if it does get to you know a point where someone needs a little bit more support. Hopefully within that organization, they can provide that support in terms of speaking with management or, you know, uh, looking at whatever's necessary to assist that, that person. It could be even just, you know, additional supervision or additional training or um, you know, shifting clients around or reducing hours for a, a short period of time. You know, it could be just HR type um, uh, assistance so uh, but they are very very different spaces they might just look the same for short periods of time um, uh, if we put both of them um, on video and we watch them because it's not unusual for someone to um, get quite emotional uh, I mean I remember talking with my, 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 my supervisor where I had a loved one who was unwell um, I remember talking to them and, and, and uh, crying for, for, I'm starting to feel it now, um, for quite a lot of that session. And um, 
you know, a, a lot of it was targeted at, at um, obviously what I was going through and what I was feeling. Um, uh, but they were very much still steering it about, still being compassionate and, and understanding, but they weren't doing grief and loss counselling with me um, because that's not what they were trying to do. It might have looked like there was some of that going on um, uh, because they did what a, a good human being should do and say, gosh, you know, what's that like for you? And, you know, you know what, what, what's so upsetting about that? They, they met me as a human being and that's what a supervisor needs to do at times as well. Um, similarly, they checked in with, how would I, you know, maybe do my work and, and, you know, if a similar scenario came about with a client, how might I respond or would that affect? So they did all the right things uh, there as well. Um, that was Bruce Stevens, by the way. I'll give a plug out, 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 out to him. Um, you know, and, and, and that was extremely important uh, for, for me and, and that was in actual fact in my early career. Um, you know, he met me as a human being and provided that support, not as my therapist, but as my supervisor that I you know, intimately sort of uh, trusted that he, he would keep that and it was between him and I. Um, it was private, it was confidential and, and I didn't want to cry in front of anyone else and I felt you know, I could there. Yeah, definitely. And I think our, um, our personal lives, whether we like to admit it or not, can be so intertwined with our professional lives um and i guess that's part of what what you bring to supervision and um and fleshing that out and like you said uh, um meeting meeting each other as human to human um while remaining focused on on the aims of supervision um and you, you you'd hope that would be the, the 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 case in all professions right you you hope that um you know if you ever had to meet a police officer they would meet you as a human being first right and 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 they would still be professional but they'd meet you as a human being so whatever it is that, that they need to do with you whether it's have a conversation and take down the details or you know um take a statement as a witness to something or arrest you we want them to be professional um uh you know, in my eyes, uh, to be human. You know, we, 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 we've seen, unfortunately, um, uh, examples, particularly in the US recently, about when, when, when police have not um, been very kind to, to people um, uh, who have been apprehended and, and there's no need to go out and, and, you know, harm people after they are, you know, handcuffed and apprehended. You know, that, that shows you not treating them as a human. As a matter of fact, they're not even bloody treating him as a as an animal because we shouldn't be doing that to an animal either. It's, it's, you know, so meeting, I, I think a good supervisor, you know, have a good that that really good strong um, relationship, and hence why I think it's really good to pick someone that you look up to or you know has that experience or or they've got a particular skill set that you are interested in. So obviously, you know, if you're interested in doing child adolescent assessments make sure you go out and see someone who's exceptional in that. And if you, if you, um, you know, like, like uh, to do DBT, find yourself a really good DBT, you know, clinician that, that you can approach and say, can you be my supervisor? Mm. And um, should supervision in general be paid for by the uh, company that you're employed by, or is that in some instances the cost of the psychologist? Sure. Look, I, my, my belief is if, if you are employed, um, you should be, uh, that should be paid for. Um, so that should be part of, of, of what you're, you're receiving. So no, no different to you get paid if you go for, you know, breakfast with the team, they're, they're paid hours, you know, you should have paid food. You shouldn't have to pay for that you're, 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 you're yourself, unless it's a different arrangement. Um, uh, but supervision is a part of what we do. It's, it's no different to, you know, professional development, I think that should be paid for as well. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're looking for a specific um, supervision uh, that is going to um, uh, advance your career but not necessarily be in line with, with, with what the organisation is, is, is looking for, then that might be something that you have to go out and, and cover yourself. Uh, but generally speaking, 
Um, most large organisations will, will, will have you know, internal supervision and there'll be good, good uh, clinicians there to do so. Um, so generally speaking, uh, you know, I know that when, when I worked with Catholic Care, you know, that was one of the things that, that um, you know, they, they, they were big on. Um, you know, they, they do all of that in-house and it wasn't even just necessarily your formal supervision. I think that informal supervision is so helpful and hence why bigger teams are, you know, uh, are important. Yeah, definitely. Um, that informal supervision can do wonders on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I guess I'm also wondering, just still on the topic of supervision, um, if you're working with a supervisor and you have a great relationship with them, you're very happy with them, but perhaps there's a specific therapeutic approach you feel might be beneficial with the client and that supervisor isn't very specialised, if I can use that word, in that approach. Um, is it okay? Are there any things that you have to consider in um, seeing maybe another supervisor for a, a one-off session or something like that to talk a bit about that therapeutic approach? Is that possible? I, I imagine so. I think most people would be, you know, most organisations would be amenable to that. Yeah, I, I think you'd be crazy not to. Um, you know, that that's the value of having a large team where someone who you know does have a great passion if i talk about our niche here, here who you know is an exceptional cbt clinician um and i've seen his in, in, you know in action and, and in my eyes is very impressive if someone wanted to to really do strong you know uh, cbt that's very methodical um uh, not that it's not you know, uh, 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 inflexible, it's quite, quite flexible and the use of words, you know, second to none, I'd, I'd, I'd be going straight to our niche, um, you know, and, you know, furthermore, we might even just go there and say, well, what, what's a different perspective as to how you would approach this particular case, you know, just to hear what you think. Um, mm -hmm. Once again, it's really about broadening our, our um, uh, perspectives because we all have a style and it's important that we get exposure. Um, so I think it's great to, I mean, that, that would show eagerness from an early career, you know, it's like to say, you know, I want to, I want to learn more, you know, because the, the learning is only just started once you, once you leave uni, because, you know, you're in a, it, it's, it's a harder time to probably study, but I think your, your exposure is much greater. So you've got greater capacity to, to, um, put into practice. Mm, definitely. Really great points. Um, so I guess this might not be so relevant to early career psychologists, but perhaps something that um, some of them might be thinking about for the future, and that's um, maybe opening up a practice and hiring um, and having employees. So I am guess I'm wondering if you could speak briefly about what um, people might consider if they're thinking of heading into that space. Uh, op opening up their own practice in, in total or you talking about like um, going into private practice as a contractor? Oh, either or. <laughs> either or. Okay. Think so either or, yeah. I think I was more talking about opening up their own uh, own practice and hiring employees rather than a cro contractor, but um, I think it'd be great to speak on both if you can. <laughs> speak on both. Let, let, let me quickly run over the contractor uh, scenario as, as, as purely considerations. Um, and then talk about the other side. Um, the contractor role is one that's always got a little bit of difficulty in being able to fully appreciate in terms of, obviously as a contractor, you go in and you see clients and the clients that you see is what is, is how you get paid. Is you get paid a, you know, a percentage of, um, of the fee. And of that percentage, it's really important to remember 10% of that is going to have to be put aside to give to the government for GST. About 9.5% 9 .5 of that needs to be put aside for your superannuation. And I know a lot of contractors don't do this. Um, they get themselves into trouble later in life. Um, there is a consideration about whether to go out and, and, and get additional um, uh, workers' comp, for example, uh, workers' compensation. That can be a small percentage, one and a half to 2% um, that you kind of need to put aside. Contractors need to go out and put uh, aside um, income tax. Once again, they forget to do so. They get tax liabilities. It's a headache. Um, hence why they need to be doing regular basses. Um, so every, every quarter, make sure they get a, 
you know, a, a good accountant, there's obviously expenditure there too. And also appreciating that of all those, you know, of the fee and then taking away the 10%, the 9.5, et cetera, et cetera, you've also got to account for uh, billable hours. Uh, so they are, you know, when, 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 when you're working for, let's say, you know, seven and a half hours, um, if you're running a very tight ship, you might be able to kind of, you know, see that five range um, uh, because you won't be able to see all clients because they don't show up, they cancel late, et cetera. Um, uh, there's also unpaid annual um, uh, leave. So, you know, there's 20 days in that or four weeks. There's unpaid sick leave. There's 10 days in that or two weeks. Um, there's those 13 public holidays that you don't get paid for. Uh, there is, you know, professional development days that you don't get paid for, plus you've got to pay for the actual professional development as well. Um, there is, you know, supervision that's obviously um, needs to be paid for. And if, you, if you're seeing doing supervision once a, you know, fortnight, we're kind of looking at sort of, you know, 24 you know, sessions or about three days uh, that you don't get paid for. And in actual fact, you've got to pay for. Um, uh, you know, it's, you don't get a regular income. If you want to get a loan, the bank doesn't look at you specifically in the same way because they're not as, as, as um, um, uh, amenable to that. Uh, and then there's some of those family things in terms of, you know, the team culture and, you know, uh, each to their own type of scenario. They're, they're, there's, it's a competitive nature. Um, uh, and so wherever there's great competitiveness, it changes how, you know, we respond because you know i'm getting more you're getting less why are you getting less i'm getting more how are the clients being distributed do i need to find my own clients you know what am i doing for marketing what are you and so on um uh, and obviously you know admin support uh, uh, you know uh, there, there, there tends to be less uh, administrative support um in, in in those spaces so they're all a little bit different um if i talk about how to start you know, if i talk about that competitiveness of starting your own practice um it's probably where competitiveness becomes a lot more important um uh look starting your own obviously it starts out as your, your, your yourself and wanting to kind of branch out to have employees and the like um, get ready to work uh, and the reason why, why why I say that is you're running a business uh, so it's no different to if you're a chef you've got two jobs one is to cook food and the other one is to run a business and as a business owner you've got to be able to do all the things that are required for for business so <clears throat> in the world of a psychologist um, you need to be able to find a space you need to be able to negotiate that space and get yourself a decent contract um, you need to know whether there are outgoings um, that are in that contract or you know, whether they're going to be passed on or whether they're going to be you know within your lease uh, you need to know out clauses and what that's going to cost you and you know whether there aren't any know um uh, uh, uh make good clauses and the like in those spaces so th this is just like the, the the lease you've got to make sure you get a really good lawyer to to look over that um because uh, when you, you you tend to be stuck in those and they're, they're commercial arrangements make sure you get really 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 good good help there um you're going to need to go out and make sure you have a really good accountant um, you know, and bookkeeper because we are not specialists in accounting and bookkeeping. So we should really go out and outsource that. Um, once again, one of the stupid things that I did, um, I was my bookkeeper um, uh, for, for, for some time and, and I certainly knew, knew um, MYOB fairly well. Uh, and look, that, that's helpful. But as I said, get ready to work. So you're not going to do 38 hours. Um, you get ready to do you know, many, many, many more, 50, 60. Um, you know, I, I still regularly probably do you know, close to you know, 60 hours. Um, during COVID time, it was, you know, 100 plus. Uh, this is what you got to do to, to, you know, survive and to keep going. And so get ready to work. And you've got to be pretty damn good at you know, a lot of things. Marketing, another example. Get ready to market. 
you need to know how to go out and market all the different places. There's a million different ways to market. Um, you know, you can go out and, you know, uh, uh, do flyers, pamphlets, you know, website, uh, you know, email around, tell, tell your GPs, um, try and make appointments with, you know, possible referrers, advertising on the, you know, um, the bus you know, the bus station or, or on a bus. Um, th th there's an infinite number of places where you can go out and advertise. Facebook, you know, uh, LinkedIn. You, you've got to know how to market. And once again, you've also got to make sure you really know the APRA regulations around that uh, because they are very tight. There's certain things you can do that you can't do. Um, and you don't need those headaches. Make sure you've got a really good web person because you know, everyone sees everything these days on, on, on the web. The first thing they're going to see is, is finding your website. Um, I could go into a thousand details for everything, but I tell you what, there, there, there's an infinite number of things. And when you start going into um, the technical things, so the, the legal things, uh, whether it's um, accounting, whether it's um, you know, the lease side of things, whether it's uh, employment contracts and fair work, um, uh, whether it's you know, taxation law and, and what you need to make sure that you are um, doing. In so many ways, you have to know those spaces well enough that even when you outsource it, you can check them. So what I mean by that is uh, you can't hand over any job to anyone in its entirety and have, well, I would say it would be naive to, to have full faith in that they can do what you think they're going to do. It sounds like this could be a whole other podcast in itself. <laughs> Hence, um, get ready to work, right? Yeah. Um, because you've got to kind of have a reasonable sense of many, many, uh, many things and, and get ready to, to make a heap of errors. You know, the, it's all going to be big mistakes, costly yeah. mistakes, um, but this is what you learn. So this is why people who either go, go out on their own, um, uh, uh, usually fairly driven, um, you know, they are, you know, they push hard. Um, they like to put in a lot of hours, you know, as I said, different things for different beasts um, and and probably that side of the beast was probably what pulled me into, uh, you know, going straight out of union to private, um, you know, to set up my, 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 my myself, you know, stupid move. But that was that, that ambitious side alongside my, my, my passion for, for, for psychology. Um, if I had it again, I, I definitely would have done it different. I think it would have been much more, um, successful as well you know, doing it in a different different version but um uh definitely wouldn't wouldn't uh change it because uh, you only get you only get to throw the dice at it once and so you know you, you do what you think is best at the time and you know no regrets um, yeah but yeah so there's a lot on that side um you know the uh, the the, the contractor side is obviously you don't have to put in that volume of, of, of work, but it is still competitive and there are competing demands. You're going to have less, um, less of a team feel and, 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 and culture in general. Uh, and then obviously the employee is the employee. We, we actually know what we're getting. Um, just read your contract and you know what, what the conditions are. And, and in actual fact, fair work looks after all of that anyway. So no one can do anything beyond that. Yeah. Sounds like there's a whole other podcast worth of considerations that we could talk about in these in space. But I don't want to scare anyone in terms of going out and starting something. We need, you know, lots of practices out there. We need to, you know, maintain a strong, strong industry. So go out and do that. But it is, it is a, a certain, it takes a certain person. And, and I, I've seen a lot of people try, um, but it hasn't been their, their personality. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's sad to go out and see someone who um, uh, uh, we can see they're ambitious in their mind, but they're not ambitious in their behaviour. Uh, and, you know, it, it only causes grief. Uh, uh, and, I, and I think we've got to, you know, for people who are ambitious in their behaviour, um, you know, at least the probability goes up of being able to make it successful and, you know, trying to 
to, to forge something. Um, but yeah, get get ready to to um, learn a whole new bunch of skills. Yeah, and I think you've given some fantastic um, insights and considerations that psychologists could um, look into if they choose to take that path. Um, like I said, it, it's probably a little bit um, later down the track for a lot of early career psychologists, but I think it's, it's great to be aware of and great to be aware of um, what to consider if that does become an option later on in our career. So, um, yeah, I think you've given some great insights there. Um, I guess before we wrap up, are there any final kind of um, words of wisdom, words of advice for early career psychologists, any key uh, takeaways? Oh, gosh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I think we've covered most of it, but I think you, what, what, what's important is to, you know, we all started, and this is probably true for any, any industry, we started our careers uh, with something in mind. Uh, I remember. I remember when I worked with uh, with the Canberra Raiders many years ago. Now, and uh, I remember doing a, a visualization with uh, with the team, and uh, I took them to Grand Final Day, uh, and you know what it was like to put on that jersey and how important, you know, what that jersey represented and to walk out of the locker rooms and then enter the stadium and you know, hearing the roar uh, and, you know, feeling uh, the support that was there, the people that they were representing, the, the, the honour of that and then looking back at the, the crowd and you know, finding their family member uh, and just kind of connecting, touching eyes. And kind of knowing that you know, when I get the ball, I'm going to represent all these people. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to take the trophy home. This is why I trained when I was six years old. This is what it's about, right? We're there for the trophy. We, we really want to win. For a psychologist, I'm... I know we all started for a reason, many of us for similar reasons. I think it's important for us to honour that and to think about where will I honour that, the people that I see, the organisation that I want to be in that, that represents me as well, that I'm going to be proud of to say, you know, hey mum, hey dad, you know, hey spouse, hey friends, I, I work here. I mean, I work with these people and, and, and these people are underprivileged or these are young people or, um, you know, our organisation is, is at the cutting edge. We, we, we try and do things different. Whatever it is, to, it, it represents you and you want to go to work. I'm developing my skills, I'm honing my craft. I'm, you know, I want to take this, this trophy home and the trophy is to be able to do our work um, in a place that, that, that we love. Um, so find that place. Uh, you know, sometimes we need to delay that as well, where we might take a position in one area, you know, as a as a, as a milestone, you know, and then we take we, we jump to the next one and to the next one, and and for some, as as we spoke about, it might be that 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 private practice, you know, a, a business owner, is that space, you know, uh, but we can put on the jersey in that first role as much as we can when it's our jersey. Um, and I think uh, if we can be true to, to why we're doing psychology, uh, we'll, I think we'll also be uh, the best for our clients too. Yeah. Fantastic. I think that's a great place to end this podcast. So thank you so much. I think that was incredibly valuable for me personally and hopefully for many other people. And um, I'll speak to you next time. Thanks, Mary. And look, if there's any, if there's any questions that come out of this, uh, happy, for, happy for anyone to, to you know, write questions. Maybe a good place is, is either you know, find me on, on um, you know, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, wherever it might be, um, you know, in the comments and in, in, 
um, on YouTube. Um, please, please let me know. Happy to happy to chat. Um, happy to you know ring ring anyone up and say you know howdy and you know answer further questions. So thanks, Mary. Good good chatting again. And um, yeah, look, looking forward to our next time. Fantastic. Thanks, Nash. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.